Hey guys, Quicksilver Gaming here, bringing you another episode of Ultimate General American Revolution. On Sunday, we released a major patch, which was the entire United States campaign, basically the entire base game minus the British campaign in one patch. And I said at the end of the last episode, hey, this probably needs some hot fixes right away, as to be expected, because this is an early access game, and anytime you add a lot of content, to an early access game, there will be hot fixes needed. Well, lo and behold, Sterner gave us two hot fixes since that patch has released. So Monday hot fix, Tuesday hot fix. Absolutely love what he is doing. And I thought I would just share some of the changes that have been made since Sunday because there's actually some really big ones and just wanted to show off that these developers are listening. I can't stress this enough, guys. Like. It is insane to have developers that not just have their goal and vision, but listen to community feedback and implement that community feedback where it makes sense. And I feel like these developers are just hitting it out of the ballpark with how they are taking the feedback from us, the player base, and implementing it into this game. It's you, you can look at so many other games out there, and there are so many wish lists from players, but man. If it is possible in Ultimate General American Revolution, it feels like Sterner and Panda Kraut and then the dev team are trying their hardest to implement it into the game as long as they have the resources and the time to do so. So before we get started, if you guys haven't checked out my patch overview going over the entirety of the update that released the full US campaign, check it out in the top right hand corner. Pretty cool video there. I go over a lot of stuff. It's about 30 minutes long, but um, I, I would highly recommend it. And at the very end, there is a tidbit of what's coming in the future, and it got me super excited. Now, let's just say uh, I've been asking for deployment zones for a really long time, and I think I'm going to be pretty happy in the future. But let's dive right on into these hotfixes and see what Sterner has to say. So on Monday, Sterner wrote, Hello Generals, we work to fix all reported issues. Here are the first results from today. Tomorrow we will continue to stabilize Backer Build 3. So I guess one of the bugs that kept happening is that your general gets stuck in the garrison. So theoretically they fixed that. Cool, I didn't know that was happening, but I guess enough people were reporting that their general was getting stuck in the garrison. Uh, one big thing here is people felt like ships were pretty useless Come this builder patch so they balance the cost of ships so that production gives you at least 100% profit from mined resources and 50% from, from bought at market. So basically what this is is people were saying it was more cost effective to sell all of the resources that it takes to build a ship in their raw form than it was to use those resources to build a ship and then sell said ship. So theoretically now it's more, um, you make a larger profit making the ship and selling it. At least that's what this basically states here. They also reviewed the economics. Mining cost gives 200% profit if you sell resources, an additional two times if you produce something and sell it. So people were saying that the mining, that the cost to mine resources was too expensive for how little the resources were selling on the market. So in this, basically they've doubled the profit of selling those resources on the market and then two times the amount if you produce something and sell it. So in that example, that would be like cannons, weapons, um, gunpowder, or ammunition. It's not gunpowder, it's ammunition, things like that. So I, I like that. I really like the concept of if you make something, it sells for more. Now I'm curious what exact the exact numbers here are because 200% in two times, to me that's the same thing. Maybe my math is really terrible right now, it might be that revolutionary math, but let me know if you guys interpreted this one the same way. Uh, they also added the ability to disband mercenaries, which this is such a small thing, but people were finding out that when they hired Native Americans, that they were unable to disband those units later if they didn't want them. And I think that's pretty, pretty important. I, I don't know how replenishing those units works at the moment. So uh, in my mind, it's probably like the unit gets so decimated that just like disband it and buy a brand new one later. 
an absolutely massive change that this was causing major problems with everybody that dove right in on, on into the patch. And I mentioned that there were people that had like Hartford down to 27% loyalty due to the loyalty um, debuff that you get for taking casualties in battle. So they changed how that works. They said reworking the effect of unit losses on home city loyalty. Now the big cities practically don't feel these losses. So that would be like Hartford and Boston and New Haven and those ones. But the small cities mourn the dead. So I'm assuming that's sort of like your New York cities or Upper Canada, Upper, um, uh, I guess at the time, Massachusetts. Uh, so th that would be my assumption that the, the cities that have a very small population, they will feel those casualties. Whereas your large cities, they really shouldn't feel the casualties. And I, I kind of like this system. I still, I, I don't mind taking a loyalty loss from casualties if there's like a, a way to counterbalance it where you could gain loyalty for your units doing really well. But I guess th this is probably a system that will always need balancing and tweaking, but I think they're going in the right direction. And the fact that they listened to us and said like, hey guys, this, this mechanic is way too punishing. And they said, okay, let's, let's change it. Um, they they might have gone too far the other direction, but as I said, um, this is one of those mechanics that I think you're going to have to balance even once the game is launched. Like, figure out that sweet spot of what they want to do. Um, I, I said this in my last video. The general consensus is that a loyalty mechanic tied to casualties or battles lost or things like that, it makes sense and it's a cool concept. It's just the implementation has to has to be fun. And that's going to be the hardest challenge for the devs. But as I said, they already changed it. They're already listening to community feedback. And I, I think this is a good step in the right direction. Um, so I, I'm pretty, or I shouldn't say I'm pretty happy. I'm really happy to see they fix that on day one. Also, reworking effect of home city loyalty on a unit. If the home city has too low loyalty, the unit may rebel. Now, I'm fine with that. Um, previously, a long time ago, uh, the English could sabotage a unit and you would just like straight up lose the unit. And that one felt really rough. But if your unit is from a territory that has low loyalty, that's fine to me. That That's like a risk factor there. Like, maybe I should disband this unit or... Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I like this concept a lot because if your hometown is going to change sides and go to the Redcoats, then you're probably going to change sides and become a Redcoat. So this one, I th this is one of the few instances where units flipping sides is okay with me. I know it didn't bug other people as much as it did me, but for me, it bugged me a lot. But this one, I'm very, very okay with. And uh, I actually kind of like that because it gives you a reason to not have your cities go low loyalty other than the city itself could rebel too. So the next change is that they're editing descriptions of unit perks. This is always going to be an in-progress feature, but what they're talking about is such as like discipline training here that says plus 10 willpower, plus 5 efficiency, assault course, plus 10 willpower, melee, and stamina. There's other perks in here that are like minus 10% reload speed or plus percent this, and I think those ones create a lot of confusion. Generally in game, if it's green, that means it's a positive. If it's red, it means a negative. But a lot of these abilities are based off of a stat. So um, generally in game, based on the mechanics, if it said minus 10% reload speed, if it's a stat and it, the stat is like 0 to 100 and you have a reload speed of 50, as worded, what that would mean is they take 5 away because 5 is 10% of 50, and your reload speed would go down to 45, which is a bad thing. But how it's being worded is that your reload speed is getting faster. So like how they've got it worded is say your reload speed takes 50 seconds, minus 10% reload speed goes down to 45 seconds. And I think there's a lot of confusion in that stuff because the game is based more off of, like if you look at this unit, it's more based off of a linear scale of like 0 to 100. So I think they need to definitely clear those things up, which it sounds like they're doing. I don't know 
if they figured out the best way to do it. But I guess the best way is just make sure that positives are green and negatives are red. Um, they've also uh, edited the interface based on our reports. I don't exactly know what that is other than when I had a sea invasion in game, that thing was absolutely huge on the map. So maybe little things like that, but we don't exactly know what interface edits based on your reports means. Um, I'm assuming this will be things that show up over time where I go, oh, okay, that makes more sense. Like the specialist report could definitely um, get more, uh, become cleaner. The finance report could become cleaner. So um, not exactly sure what this is, but you know, always good to see something like that. But one thing we were noting is it's really cool that the Spanish and the French are in the game, but uh, they're sending, you know, 10 first rate ships to destroy the British fleets or, you know, a thousand gun fleets to destroy the British fleets. And uh, they were completely zerging the British and destroying their entire navy before 1776 or 1777. So they've changed the Zerg rush of European allies destroying the British fleet. Much appreciated there. I, I like the allies helping you, but I also, you know, it'd be fun to kill some of the British ships yourself. And a lot of people were saying like, hey, I'd like to capture an enemy ship, but there are none because the French killed them all. They also fix missing sea victories and global statistics. What that is, I believe, is if you go under foreign relations, there's a campaign progress. I think this is what they're talking about. I'm not entirely sure, but I'm assuming it's like the sunk ships here. I could be completely wrong on that because it just says missing sea victories in global statistics. So not, not entirely sure if that's what it's talking about. It might be talking about something else and I just haven't figured out what it is yet. Another change is that they basically are adding the ability to reduce the cost of mining and production. Uh, it says it's still in progress. I don't know exactly what they are doing here to do that. I know you already have a toggle in your colonial uh, management where you can go 100% 50, 25% off. So I'm not sure beyond that what they are exactly talking about, but any, any you know, changes and customizations are always uh, greatly appreciated there. And then fixed various errors from your reports. So there have been tons and tons and tons of reports sent in to the devs. Pandacrout goes through a lot of them. Sterner goes through a lot of them. Different dev teams go through a lot of them. I see different dev teams. I think there's only like six people working on this game, plus Pandacrout as a sort of a contractor, and he mostly works on, as I said in the previous video, like the, the nitty gritty, the dirty stuff, things like, hey, this is the wrong unit model, change that. Hey, the stats, um, like if you go under the market and look at the civilian musket, it says, you know, 865, 9. So he makes sure that the civilian musket when you get the tooltip display, also says 8659, things like that. He does a lot of the, the dirty cleanup work, which, uh, you know, is greatly appreciated in a game like this. Anytime you can just make the small things better, it really overall makes the game that much better. So that was the entirety of the Monday hotfix, which for me personally, that was enough. I was super excited that they did that. Um, there was obviously more feedback that they were given through Discord and through the uh, bug reports, and Sterner, in my opinion, blew us away on Tuesday with another hotfix with some absolutely major changes to the game and things that we had literally just been asking him for. And to show off one of them, if I go to Lester here, you notice that there are a lot more building slots available and there's two that are locked here. Now I think uh, this doesn't show the upgrade from a town hall to the capital because I this is a version of the game before this hotfix was implemented, but basically you have three levels of cities. So if I go over to Hatfield here, you have a meeting house and that's like your basic, basic level for a city and you can see that it gives me four building slots and, you know click on these building slots and you have all of these buildings that you can build from well i could upgrade it to a town hall for 2000 gold 14 bricks and i think that says 20 officers so it's not cheap but it also uh, increases lo uh does it change loyalty yeah so the meeting house is a weekly loyalty ch loyalty change of plus 0.2 percent and then the town hall is plus 0.3%. 
Now, I don't know if that's 3% and 2% or if it is a point. The point would make more sense of 0.3%. But if I go to Leicester, you can see here it has a town hall. Now, I'll show this video right here for you guys. And you can see them showing off. And there's Hatfield only has three building slots. So maybe that's because I'm on a version that's before this hotfix, the save was. So uh, the, the base town has three building slots. You upgrade it to the town hall. It has six building slots. And he just clicked there and upgraded to the capital, which is the two star. And presumably that unlocks eight building slots. And this is something we were asking for because they kept adding. And there we go. He unlocked the capital right here. I'll leave the screenshot up for a moment here where you can see the capital two star building. You have eight slots available. And we'd been asking for this because they kept adding more and more buildings into the game. And it's like, okay, well, we only have four slots per town. And, you know, it's like, if you can build a fur trader, you need to build a fur trader. If you can build a weaver's house, you need to build a weaver's house. You need tons of schools for the specialists to have low-ranking officers and specialists for your buildings. You need a recruitment center in, like, Hartford and New Haven and Boston. Um, if you have a port... That takes up one of your slots, and then you're like, well, I'd like factories, and they created the new, what is it called? It's the market, uh, market stalls, which give you income, and now the printing press has, like, a reason to be in the game, because you lose loyalty when you lose casualties, and it was like, we don't have enough slots, and uh, tons of other games have it to where you, you build up your main settlement building, and you increase like the number of slots that you're able to do or the level of the buildings that you're able to build. So it just made sense in a game like this that leveling up your town hall increased the number of slots. And this is greatly, greatly appreciated because if I go to a place like Hartford, which is going to be my recruitment center, you can see here that I've already built a recruiting house and a schoolhouse. Other things I would really like to build here, a stable would be nice to get horses for my cavalry later. An armory would be really good because you need lots of ammo to build up these units and it's a big hub so it'd be nice to have an armory there. A warehouse would be really good because you use provisions to create units so the more provisions you have the easier it is to create those units. It's also nice to have your global stockpile of provisions in the cities so it's easier to disperse them because getting them out of your global stockpile and into your cities takes time. I don't know what the per week limit is, but I, I have been told there it's like every week a certain amount of your global will go to your cities. And what I mean by global is if you go to your market and resource, uh, sorry, goods, you have your global provisions here. That's not how many provisions you have throughout your entire uh, civilization. That's what you have in your global market. Because if I go to Hatford right here, you can see they have 34 provisions. And in the market under goods, it says I only have 19. That's 19 in addition to what I already have across all of these cities. And if you look at the supply network, you can see like Newport is 29, Providence 57, Middleborough 48. So that's what I mean by taking it from your global and dispersing it to all of your cities there. So yeah, Hartford, there's the warehouse, you know, having a printing press because I'll be taking loyalty hits from the casualties as Hartford will be recruiting the largest amount of my units and then you know you want a weaver's house and you want merchant stalls so it, it's nice that you can start to actually flesh out your cities and you know like Newport one of its slots is taken by a dock I want a carpenter shop because eventually that'll upgrade to a lumber mill which then allows me to upgrade my dock to a I think it's a shipyard and then you know like they need a weaver's house and I'd love blacksmiths because that increased production points so this, like, the fact that this was introduced in a hotfix is absolutely incredible and insane. And I just can't say enough good things about that. Like, th this to me, the fact that they overhauled loyalty like that right away, they overhauled the, um, the, the French and the Spanish right away, and the fact that they overhauled how your settlements work in two hotfixes in two days... That blows my mind away. That is so awesome. I was expecting, like, you know, not really playing this for a week or so while they figure things out and, 
you know, them drop a Sunday patch, but no, Sterner's like, boom, Monday, boom, Tuesday, two major hot fixes, you're welcome. And it's like, oh, that that was like 75% of the community's complaints taken care of right there. I'm not saying they've taken care of everything. There still seems to be issues with um, like invasions, but that's more of a subjective matter. And I think that's going to be something that they try to balance throughout the entire life of this game. But like, holy cow, these are two huge changes to the game. So really, really enjoy that. So going along with the loyalty thing that we talked about, it says loyalty won't drop from slave unit casualties and deserters won't decrease loyalty in hometown. So I like those changes there because um, you, you would get de like desert really high desertion rates just moving your troops across the map or, you know, during winter, it's absolutely brutal. Or sometimes like within a city, you might have desertion rates if you're not paying them enough or if it's winter or if you're overcrowding a city. So I like that those don't affect your loyalty. Um, the slave unit one, it, it's a little bit weird. I'm not sure I fully agree with that, but you know, yeah, they're they're working on it and everything is up for debate and up for change, but it's nice that they're continuing to look into loyalty and try to get that somewhere where everybody, for the most part, is reasonably happy. Another one that's really nice is increased loot duration and increased weapon recovery. Um, They've been messing around with weapon recovery for a lot. They they nerfed it into oblivion, and then they like um, they they were afraid to increase it because the, the the fear here is that you wouldn't have to produce your own weapons to outfit your army. But I think they realize that you you get so few weapons currently from the enemy that they had to increase the weapon recovery rate, and it just feels bad when you, you know you wipe out like six thousand British soldiers in a battle, and it's like. Here's 400 brown besses and two six pounders. And you're like, oh, they had like 66 pounders in that battle, and I got two of them. So just things like that. Obviously, you don't want to go one for one with a casualty to recovery ratio, because then literally the like you wouldn't need to produce anything as the Americans. But I, I do think this is something, once again, they're probably going to have to balance throughout the entire campaign. And then Increasing loot duration, I just like that so much. I, it sucks, like, moving onto a piece of loot and it disappears before you get there. And you're like, oh, okay, well, that that sucks. So it's nice that they've increased that. Uh, they also fixed that Dragoons, Dragoons weren't able to equip the infantry carbine. And what I believe that is, is if you go under, if you go under your chief engineer and his technology tree, there is an infantry carbine somewhere in here, and I'm not entirely sure where it might be. I think it's the short brown vest 69, um, or it might have been something else. There's a dragoon carbine. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure what that is, but it was report. I saw on the Discord reported somewhere that um, that the cavalry couldn't equip it, and um, so so now they can equip that because dragoons, if you think about it. Are really mounted infantry more so than they are cavalry. They do have a saber, but a lot of times in history, dragoons are uh, dismounted infantry that then use carbines to shoot at the enemy. They've also increased population growth, which as the campaign goes on, you really start to feel this that you're you start to lose the ability to recruit more men and uh, like. Not having the ability to recruit more men as the war goes on kind of makes sense, but from a gameplay standpoint, you're like, oh, okay, how am I supposed to deal with the uh, 20,000 man invasion in New York when I can't recruit any more soldiers? So having the population growth increase, I think, is an overall healthy thing for the game. And then to top it off, different minor fixes. So I just wanted to go over these because these weren't your generic hot fixes. This, this is like a absolutely major update to an update and i figured this is something we need to talk about because i've been i've been testing out the game trying out different things and it's like okay i don't really want to start a campaign until i feel like they're not releasing a hot fix every day but with that being said i'm super appreciative that they are releasing these hot fixes very quickly and very timely because there's you know there's people that they they would say like the game is unplayable at the current moment and whether or not you agree with them, you know, that person's enjoyment of the game was suffering because of 
um, like balance issues or bugs in the game. And he, as, as a new company or a smaller company with a game in early access, you obviously want your uh, early access players to, to be happy and continue playing the game because those are the people that are saying like, hey, have you played Ultimate uh, General American Revolution? Have you checked it out? Have you put it on your Steam wish list? Like those are the people that will sell the copies of the game for you because they'll put the good word out and say like, hey, this game is super awesome. Um, and I, I hope you guys get that from me. Um, e even though at times I can be very critical of this game and I understand, you know, some people don't like that as much. And in my next playthrough, I definitely plan to reel that back at like considerably. Um, I hope you guys realize like I'm one of those people that wants wants people to enjoy this game. I so if I'm having fun, I believe other people will have fun. And if there's a mechanic that I think is not going to be fun for people, I really try to, in a respectful way, tell the devs, tell Panda Kraut, get give feedback, show in my videos like, hey, this is where it's, you know, not working. And the whole objective there is to get the game to this awesome, better place. And, you know, Sterner doesn't know what's wrong with the game if he isn't told. So I, I always tell people, like, if something's not right, even if it's not a bug, if you're just like, this is ridiculous, like, I, I don't like this, you know, that's the usual response on Discord. Press F11, hit that bug report, and report it so that Sterner and the dev crew can look at your game log and go like, oh, okay, that, that, that's actually a bug, like, that shouldn't have happened that way. Um, so I, I, I said this in the last video, I just feel like we as a community have such a huge opportunity to help this dev team make this an absolutely fantastic day one game and the devs they, they seem super appreciative for all the feedback that we give them and we're rewarded with you know updates that provide content that we requested and that I, I just i can't say how amazing that is enough times it's uh I, I'm just blown away because there's been so few games that I play where the devs actually listen. Um, and I, I truly mean that. There, I've played so many other games where it's like, hey, what about this like minor fix that would make so many people happy? Nah. Oh, okay. These devs are like, what about this absolutely major like change in how settlements work? And the devs are like, yep, got it. Dropped on Tuesday. We got you. That's, I, I, it's like priceless. That, that's the best way to word it. Anyways, that is enough for today's video. Please like, comment, subscribe, all of that YouTube jazz. We just hit a thousand subscribers and I can't say how thankful I am to all of you. Um, I love every comment, even the ones that might rile me up a little bit. I, I love all the comments that you guys leave. I try to respond to every single one or at least, you know, give it a heart or thumbs up. And I, I can't say enough. I appreciate all of you so much. This journey has been absolutely amazing. And I hope to continue bringing more and more videos, whether they are playthroughs, um, patch note updates, reviews of games, or in the future, uh, I put a poll out, um, like some more narrative campaigns, like the ones where you see people like, I survived 100 days. I just think that would be cool to be like, George Washington made it one year through the American Revolution and like show his journey through the American Revolution through this game. I think things like that would be cool, but that is it for today's episode. As always, guys, until next time.